Hello and welcome to Gabbit Media, I'm Grant Abbott and today we're looking at part 2 of Node School. This is the series where we try to understand nodes in creating materials for our objects. In this episode we're looking at textures that we can plug into our nodes to change the feel of our materials. The links to the playlist are in the description. If you're interested in modelling then do check out the playlists that are also in the description and generally check the playlist to my channel for other courses. If these courses aren't detailed enough then I strongly recommend the CG Boost course it's really in depth and detailed and I can thoroughly recommend it. Once again, links in the description. So I always find it more interesting when we're testing materials to look at something like a sphere instead of a cube. So I'll delete the cube and shift A to add UV sphere. It's a tiny bit chunky, so we'll go across to the modifiers and add a subdivision surface modifier. That will subdivide it and then we can right click shade smooth and we've got a nice smooth sphere. So next to play with our shading, let's go to the shading workspace up the top here. I'll press period key on my numpad to zoom into my object. And I'm in look dev at the moment so I can see the results and I've got an HDRI in the background. So at the moment this has no material, so I can add a new material down here. And hopefully this is all just a reminder to you. I'll move this workspace up a touch so I can see a bit more of my nodes. And I've just made my text a bit bigger so you can easily see it. So once again we go from left to right, so our material output is here. And this is our principled BSDF. And as a quick reminder last time, the main slots are the base colour, the roughness, and we've got the metallic here as well. There is another really useful slot, which is the normals. We will talk about the other ones at a later date, but for now, base colour, metallic, roughness, and normals are going to be the main ones that we look at. So it's a very quick challenge. Try and make a shiny red plastic ball. So that should be fairly easy for you. You change the base colour here, and we change it across to red. Remember, we can change the tone here. I'll leave it around there. The roughness needs to come down so it becomes more shiny or glossy as it's sometimes known. And the metallic stays where it is because it's a plastic. So it's non-metallic, also known as dielectric. If I want to make it metallic, it can change quite considerably. So hopefully you got something that looks like this. If you did, well done. Now you'll notice that this node here has inputs as well. So these points here, much like the material output, has an input of surface and our BSDF is hooked up to that. We've also got inputs for each of our attributes to the BSDF node. So we can actually hook stuff up to, let's say, the color to change the color here. So let's do that. So Shift A to add, or you can go to the Add menu here, but it's good to get used to the shortcuts. So Shift A to add, Texture, and we've got lots of these different textures that we can add. Let's try the Wave Texture to start with. So in order to plug this in, I can then just drag from the yellow to the yellow and we've got a wave texture going across our object. So the first thing to note about this is that, generally speaking, the colors will match up. So yellow going to yellow, and you can see green being an output here, going to the green input here. And you can see that some of these have a gray input. So what happens if I link this gray one up to the color? Well, it looks like it's made no difference, but actually the factor is a black and white version of the color. And because the color in this case is black and white, it's making no difference. So let's try a different texture where we do have some color. So I'll delete this one. Shift A to add, texture, and let's try the magic texture. So if I plug the color in now, we get some sort of weird representation of magic. But now if I go from the factor to the color, we get the black and white. But if I plug the factor into the roughness and take out the base color for the moment, so the base color is red, but you can see that some parts are shiny and some parts are rough if I move around slightly. So it's taking this black and white image and it's going into the roughness. So the black bits are zero and the white bits are one. And that's quite an important thing to understand and I'll be going through that a bit more later on. So don't worry if you don't completely understand that at the moment. But if I unplug this for a moment, we can see the roughness value of zero is glossy, so really shiny and a roughness value, if I take it all the way up to one, is completely rough. And if we look at the magic textures factor as it's known, or the black and white details of that color, and I'll just plug it into the color so we can see it for the moment, you can see that there's black bits here and white bits, so the white bits will be rough, they'll be fully to one, and the black bits will be fully to zero, so they'll be shiny. So when I plug this into the roughness, look at where the black bits are for an example, now those black bits, you can see, are shiny. So all these grey inputs are looking for black and white textures and wherever there's white it will be one 
and wherever it's black, it will be zero. And any greys are obviously in between. So you should be able to see that the greys are slightly reflective, whereas the whites are completely rough and therefore you can't make out the reflections. And most textures have a color slot and a factor slot. The color obviously being color information and the factor being black and white information of the color. And in some cases you'll find that both will be the same because the texture is a black and white texture. Let's plug the color back into the base color. And now we've got the darker colored areas still shiny, but we've got the color over the top as well. So if I take out the roughness, it's completely rough in this case. So we can't see much of our reflections, but I take that black and white information in and the dark bits of my texture should now be shiny. Don't panic too much if this isn't sinking in completely, but we'll be testing this out, practicing with it and having a bit of fun as we go along. So the first thing to do is have a bit of fun by plugging in some of the textures. So I'll unplug these, delete this and shift A to add. Just go through each of these and see what they do. So as an example, I'll try a slightly different one this time, the Veronoi, to plug that in color to the color and change the scale around, change it to 2D, change the randomness and let's just see what we get. So have a go at that. So I'll unplug this for now and delete it. One thing you may have noticed when you press Shift A and go to textures, that some of these textures are just sort of 2D. So if I take the brick texture, for example, and bring it in, plug the color into the color, we can see that this is a 2D texture. So it's projecting from the top here. So if I look at the top, it looks like bricks, but then it projects and stretches its way through until it reaches the bottom where it's the same as the top. Now, obviously we can change lots of our parameters, which can make it look quite interesting and unusual. But eventually we want to stop it from just being 2D and think about the way it's projected onto our object. And that's the next tricky thing to understand. I'll press Shift A to add and I'll add in a different one this time. So we'll go for the Musgrave and I'll bring the brick texture down here. Now the Musgrave, if we plug that in, it's got this option here where it says 3D and we're seeing that with a few of our textures now in 2.82. If I change this to 2D, it projects it down from the top. Let's up the scale so you can sort of see that stretching. So if I go to the top, it looks like what you'd expect from a Musgrave texture. Then it stretches down through the middle and projects to the bottom again. And when I say project, it's like there's a projector at the top here shining this image onto our object. So some of these textures will project in different ways. And this will project all over the sphere with this 3D option here. And most of these procedural textures, as they're known as, if I press Shift A and go to Texture, most of these are what's called procedural textures. So they use computer algorithms to create different colors or shapes, which we can see in our texture there. But if I press Shift A again and go to Texture, there's other ones like Environment Texture or Image Texture, which are not procedurally based. So if I bring in Image Texture for the moment, so you can see what that looks like, and let's zoom into that a bit, I'll take off the Musgrave and plug this in. Now it's not showing us anything at the moment and that's because I haven't got an image in here. So with an image texture, you can download an image or create an image and plug it in to each of your slots. So if I press open now and just find a random texture, this one for example from textures.com, we can see that's been placed onto the surface but we've got some interesting things happening and it's squishing up the top here and down the bottom here. But if I plug my Musgrave in, that's evenly distributed when I have the 3D option enabled. And what's going on here is we're seeing the different ways in which Blender is interpreting 2D images into 3D. So whilst these procedural textures, many of them have this new 3D slot to make them into sort of 3D projections, it's important to understand that textures as a whole, especially ones you find off the internet or create yourself, are going to be 2D. And somehow the 3D programs have to figure out how to get these 2D images onto a 3D object. And that's where things like unwrapping and projection are all important. So I'll unplug this and I'll just grab these and move them out the way for the moment and focus on our texture. So if I plug this in again, and don't follow along with this bit, but if I press Control T, that will bring up the mapping and transform coordinates. Now that will work for me because I've got the Node Wrangler installed, which I'll talk about more in a later episode, but I'll just briefly explain what's going on here. This is a mapping node and a texture coordinate node. Now the mapping node tells you where it's being projected onto the object. So if I change things around here, like the rotation, 
or maybe the location and the scale. It's changing the way that this texture will be mapped onto our object. I'll just reset those to zero and reset these to one. But the important thing that I want you to note is the texture coordinates here. So there's several options here. The main ones you'll probably want to worry about are the UV and the object. And at the moment it's using the UV map. If I go to the UV editing workspace, we can see we're in edit mode and I've got everything selected and all those vertices that are selected are being mapped out like this onto our 2D texture. So this has been unwrapped and spread out like this. And if I go to look dev mode, we can see how that texture then maps onto the surface. And you can see all these points as they come together here are actually really spread out here. Hence why we get this sort of distortion and stretching in our texture. So for now, let's go back to shading mode. That's just a very brief introduction to how textures are placed onto our objects. And we'll talk much more about this later, but I'm just trying to touch on these ideas so you roughly understand what's going on. So we'll be using actual textures later on, so I'll delete these for now. And what we'll have a play with is these procedural textures that we see here. And when I say procedural, they're the ones that the computer creates by themselves. And we can adapt these sliders to make some interesting shapes. So what I wanted to try and do is to make some interesting textures using these procedural textures that you can find in Shift A, Texture, and all along here. Test them out, plug them in, change the sliders, maybe change the drop down menus and see what they do. Plug them into things like the base color and the roughness, maybe even into the metallic or just change the metallic to metal or not and see what you can come up with. One last thing that I will quickly show you is how you can add bumpiness to them. So down here, as I said earlier, we've got the normal map and that controls the bumpiness amount of your object. And we can use these procedural textures and plug them in to this normal map. But you can see this is yellow and this is blue. So we can't go straight from a yellow to a blue. We have to have something in between to interpret it for us. So press Shift A, Vector and Bump. We'll use a proper normal map later on, but for now just using the bump because the bump will take the black and white information from your node, such as this, so we can use the factor in this case, and bring it into the height, and then it will convert it to a normal map that's readable by our principled BSDF. So the blue can therefore go into the blue. And that gives it the illusion of depth. It's not actually real depth, so it's not changing the geometry in any way. If you wanted to do that, you have to look up displacement maps, which are slightly different. But this is just changing the way the light reacts with the surface. And like I say, gives the illusion of depth. So go from the factor into the height. You can change the strength here to change the influence of that height. And remember, the white parts of your texture will be pushed outwards because it will have a value of one and therefore push outwards away from the object. And the black will be pushed inwards and the greys in the middle will stay the same position. Then you have this slider to boost those values or flatten them. So have a good play with those. Try out the bump node, which is shift A and in the vector section under bump. And you can always join the Discord server and show us your results, or you can just post an image link in the comments so we can all take a look. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.